Good evening and uh, welcome to our uh, debate tonight on the increasing importance and relevance of the knowledge economy uh, in post COVID-19 uh, era. I'm very uh, pleased to have three distinguished uh, experts on the area of knowledge economy, technology, computer science, and data science with me from San Lucia, from Dubai, United Arab Emirates, and from London. And uh, this is uh, a continuation of the various uh, global mind debates we started like two months ago during this uh, COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, we have discussed several topics during these last two months, all of them leading to our 18th international uh, conference, which will be uh, taking place on the period between the uh, 14th to 16th of July. It's going to be virtual because of the lockdown, but we were uh, hoping uh, this year we would have been hosting it physically and face to face, but because of this uh, uh, lockdown, we had to make it all virtual and uh, the, 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 the deadline for accepting labor is still open. So please try to look at our website. And if you, you are interested to join the conference, please submit your abstract and paper as soon as possible. I think the deadline 25th of uh, 15th of June, I'm not sure you can check on our website. But to give you a, big back, a quick background about uh, this roundtable debates, we have been doing this debate for the last three or four years uh, to give people an opportunity to discuss the topic which we will discuss in the conference with a wider participant from industry, from academic, from civil societies, from NGOs. And in the past, we have been able to travel and actually uh, conduct this roundtable discussion physically, like in Sudan, in Morocco, we have been to Bahrain, uh, different places. But this year, we have been conducting all these roundtable discussions online. Now, what we're going to talk about today is a knowledge economy and the importance are relevant. What exactly the core focus of today's debate is, we all have been uh, discussing the issue of knowledge economy for the last 20 or 25 years. Every country is fully aware of the importance of knowledge as an enabler for sustainable development. The World Bank from 1992, 2000, they have declared this, and we even have a global knowledge economy index where countries start to, to prove or to demonstrate uh, how, how, how much of their GDP is becoming not depending on natural risk or normal uh, goods and services, but rather than on knowledge products and services. And uh, Scandinavian countries tends to be high on this ranking, like Sweden, Norway, and these countries normally they score quite high. But we also have countries who are, their GDP is not that as big as uh, on the leading OCD countries like San Lucia, for example, but they are demonstrating a good uh, progress towards a knowledge-based economy. The knowledge-based economy has four pillars, education, innovation, ICT, information and communication technology, technologies, and competitiveness. We are not going to discuss these four different pillars in this session as standalone, but we're going to discuss the four of them Re relating to technology, innovation, and digital transformation worldwide. And I'm very pleased to have expert, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the four or the three colleagues who are going to join me shortly, they all have good experience academically and professionally and practice in the field about how technology innovation can help to really accelerate the progress of countries and companies and organizations towards increasing their dependency and share of the knowledge-based products and services in their economy. And uh, I would like to start today by an example uh, from San Lucia. San Lucia is an island in the Caribbean. It's a small island. And uh, I remember we visited San Lucia in 2010. Uh, San Lucia hosted uh, one of our international conferences under the leadership of Dr. Gail Rigobert, the Minister of uh, Education and Sustainable Development. And at that time, so when we went to San Lucia, I met the Prime Minister at that time, uh, His uh, Excellency Stevenson King. And I remember at that time, San Lucia has just had one of its uh, hurricanes. It's, that area or that part of the world in the Caribbean, 
is quite vulnerable to hurricanes every year, natural disasters, as we call them. And I remember he said, uh, as a proof of the role of ICT in saving people's life, he said, when this hurricane is stuck in Lucia, people were making phone calls to help each other about finding a safe place to escape or to protect themselves. So just by making a phone call in that island, you will be able to help other families or other citizens or to direct them to a safe place or where to go and where to stay and so on. So that was a very simple proof of the role of ICT in saving life. But the role of ICT and technology in general or ICT in general or how countries are deploying and using knowledge and ICT innovation and others is increasingly become important. And what we're going to explore today with these three distinguished experts is that they will help us to try to relate this to uh, particularly for, from their experience. For example, Walid from Dubai, he has a, a good experience in the Middle East, in uh, Belarus, in Estonia, in East Europe. We have uh, Rawad in London. He also has very good experience in the Middle East, in the UK, in Europe, and so on. But I want to start first with Dr. Uh, Lindel from San Lucia. And uh, if I will introduce you in a way, Lindil, that uh, you are a highly uh, qualified academics and uh, professional, if I can say, if I can say that. Lindil got or he obtained his master and PhD from University of Glasgow in, in the UK and Scotland. He has a wealth of experience in ICT technology. And I think what I am really interested, and we will talk about this later, his experience in terms of helping countries or in helping big organizations with their ICT policy and strategy or generally technology policy and strategy. He's leading or he founded and leading a CEO of his uh, company, which is Data Shore. He will talk to us about it. But Lindel, I would like to give you the opportunity. First of all, thank you very, very much for joining us to, tonight. And I'm not sure what is time there, but I would assume it is not definitely as comfortable time like we have it here. But thank you very much. And uh, also, uh, thank you very much for uh, contributing to the offline discussion because we have been discussing this and I have listened to quite interesting uh, uh, stuff from you. So uh, not just take us through the, the Caribbean or the, the, or the islands experience, but your global experience about this concept and give us your perspective on this uh, topic of uh, the increasing relevance and importance of knowledge economy in both COVID-19, which we hope this both COVID-19 will come as soon as possible. So the floor is yours, uh, Lynn. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you for this invitation to be here with you and the rest of the distinguished panel. I appreciate the timing of this. I think it's very relevant given where we are and where we need to be. The experience so far coping with COVID-19 has meant that there's physical distancing that we've had to maintain. Certain of us have been fearful to a certain extent of, of the future. There's the economic impact, a social impact as well. We've had to basically force ourselves to adapt and to innovate, to encourage ourselves and to cope with certain strategies for improving what we do. So the journey from where we are now to beyond COVID-19 to address our topic more centrally, there'll have to be a newfound appreciation of our skills, of what we can bring to bear. Building on successes, perhaps being cautious because the entire process, this journey will not happen overnight. It's probably going to take a matter of years, unfortunately. So to get from where we are now to post COVID, we are looking at the whole range of the vaccine development, the scaling up of production, the delivery of those vaccines to achieve herd immunity, for a country like India, let's say, thinking globally, with 1.3 billion population, that may take close to a decade, if not more. The role of knowledge management in how we handle our current situation, we will be sure to realize the links between our different sectors, especially with greater integration with our health information, especially as we look forward to the next outbreak to stay ahead of it. What we are now doing is tracking people, tracking our movements, the logistics in making that happen, and the better understanding of the linkages that are needed to do so. It's quite significant. So what 
I can see from the perspective of being in a small island developing state like St. Lucia, which is a very small economy, there's a very significant stress on the economy. We are already a resource constrained environment. When a hurricane hits us, we see physical damage. We see damaged bridges, roads, trees, landslides with a virus that's invisible causing economic damage. It's hard to see. And unfortunately, those who are not able to appreciate from the information management and knowledge management perspective, how you ought to adapt and to cope might not be as au fair as the rest of us in terms of what we ought to do, how we should be progressing with battling this contagion. It will require a proper grounding in science and technology and in information management. We are sharing data about who's traveled, where they've been, who they've been in contact with. Building on that data sharing and having better information management skills, coping and processing the sheer volume of data we've been gathering to get some meaningful insights. That's going to be critical. Taking that in those insights and developing better judgments, the knowledge management skills we need to take those insights and make some skillful and cohesive judgments for what we ought to do next. That's going to be a key factor in how we get out of this. So I can see that our progress will very much depend on how we embrace the impact of what's taking place. And we have to very carefully distinguish our scientific approach, our fact-based approach on personal beliefs. The prevailing, for the past few years anyway, beliefs encroaching into science for the case of example here, anthropogenic climate change. If you have doubts about something like that, how else might you frame your reaction to something you cannot see, like a, an invisible virus? So just to summarize very quickly, I believe we are undergoing forced innovation, especially with the severe resource constraints I've already mentioned. Boundaries of our imagination in terms of how we cope, those are being pushed aside. We really have to adopt new ways of working and develop new skills, establishing linkages, fostering innovation, and that's bound to lead to an acceptance, however grudging, of the change processes that are required and the new ways of working. But the good thing is that journey is a one-way journey. Once we start innovating, once we start embracing that change that we need, we will be forced to keep going. We will be building momentum. And I believe that's a good thing. The science and collaboration that's needed, the innovation, the technology adoption, the renaissance that's required, that I believe will benefit us significantly. And if we, for a moment, ignore the views of those who might be cornucopians, who might believe there's a way out of it no matter what, I still believe that our consistent approach to solving our problems, given our constraints, that's going to stand us in good stead. Our prolonged fight against COVID-19 will focus us on SDG number three, which is good health and well-being. Our eventual response will promote SDG number nine, industry innovation and infrastructure. That's what we will require to get out of it. But I believe most profoundly, if we look at SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities, that may present an acute challenge because we will be having to grapple with the imbalances and the scale of the challenge. Poor resource constrained countries and small island developing states that can expect to be at the bottom of the totem pole as we come out of it, we'll have a significant challenge ahead of us. And I believe it's quite timely that we're having this discussion now to help provide us with some of the thinking, some of the preparation that's needed to take us out and through into a post-COVID-19 era. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lenin. I really appreciate this, uh, quite a very good intro introduction. I will come back to you to talk to us about maybe strategy, uh, technology policy and strategy, as I said, mentioned earlier. But let me ask you this question just quickly before I go to the next speaker. Now, what is the situation with COVID-19 generally now in San Lucia? 
We are very fortunate right now that we've been able to stay on top of our infections. We have no deaths, thank goodness, and the country is starting to be reopened. We had a state of lockdown for a while. We had a curfew. It's been slowly shortened so okay. that we can now more progressively go out and, and mingle, I suppose. We do have to wear masks for protection. Our chief medical officer has been quite clear on the steps we need to take. Okay. So expect in the next month, sorry, in the next week or so, for the international travel to be, will be open for international travel. To be eased. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Thank you very much, uh, Lindel. I will uh, come back to you. Let me uh, continue the good uh, discussion you started by bringing in uh, Engineer Walid from uh, Dubai, United Arab Emirates. Walid, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I appreciate uh, very much uh, giving us the opportunity to listen to your, uh, if you like, uh, views and experience. Walid, uh, you have a, a tremendous, uh, very impressive CV. I mean, the more I read your CV, the more I say this, he's a very important person to bring on board. Uh, and what I like, you know, because we are come, we are promoters, and uh, if you like, uh, all the work we do is really about sustainable development and education. And thus, I can see that you have been in top five hundred, uh, sorry, top hundred CEOs uh, who cares, or at least sust uh, on a, with a sustainability agenda on board. You are an innovator. You are an entrepreneur. You are some of the youngest. Uh, in, in all of this top list, which is good, and I congratulate you on this. Now, but in addition to your expertise, which I would like you to, to share with us, if you can also talk to us about your specific expertise as well in uh, Estonia or Belarus, you have quite a lot of work there. So I will give you the floor to show us your perspective. And uh, again, thank you very much for your time. So the floor is yours, Walid. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alam, and uh, greeting to your um, to the other guests. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly introduce some of the milestones, the main 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 milestones in my life, uh, which have really uh, made a significant um, uh, changes uh, towards the way I see the future and the way I see uh, where I'm uh, where I'm going and where the world is going. You know, in 1995, I was a GIS student in, in last year, and I sat with a, with a friend of mine after I came from uh, summer vacation. And um, that time, you know, as a students, we used to struggle with uh, copy net notebooks, you know, finding resources and running behind libraries and all. And then he asked me to, to check something called the Internet. So he literally tell, told me that there's something called the Internet. You need to check it. And then I was like, "What? What is this? Uh, what, what is this new thing?" You know, uh, he say he, he explained it simply as a group of computers that sharing information, and then if you ask any uh, sort of uh, information, it will give you an answer. Uh, so I went next day to the research institute. I had a, a fifteen uh, minutes browsing. Uh, uh, that time it was Alta Vista and archives. And I find, yeah, this is like true, you know, it's like uh, been asking about some stuff and then I got the answer right away. So from that time, I figured out this is going to have a major impact on my life, on the life of billions of people, uh, billion of people all over the world. And that's truly happy. So, uh, so when we look at, uh, at knowledge management uh, as a concept, so as you have uh, mentioned earlier, uh, it's uh, education, it's technology and ICT, it's innovation and competitive competitiveness. Okay, uh, when we look at education and giving my uh, my examples uh, along the way to my kids today, uh, post COVID nineteen, we can see a very very significant change in the way that uh, education. Uh, is being conducted in the way that uh, young people are learning and in the tools itself, you know. Uh, there were so many red tapes before into getting, you know, a proper online education uh, earlier, like uh, about eight or, or, or ten years ago, uh, online degrees were not accredited, you know. Uh, more and more universities 
uh, got into uh, online programs, basically uh, in management, in entrepreneurship, and uh, other programs which do not require physical attendance. And then we see when the COVID uh, pandemic happened, uh, it had to shut down everything, and then all the red tapes has to be uh, eliminated, and they got even schools on board for online learning. Now, what did it take me being a father of three uh, uh, girls, you know, like um, uh, they are in eighth standard and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and sixth standard and five standard. Uh, that, uh, they, they have been uh, adapting, you know, they have been using it. They have been learning about it. They have been learning about the constraints around it. So I think looking at this sector particularly, um, things are not going to go back uh, uh, like before, you know. Uh, they will never go back like before because when we used to mentor innovations when we used to mentor entrepreneurs we asked them to consider the top three things that they cannot let go and then we ask them if you wake up tomorrow and you find for example money i cannot live without money you know yeah cash you know banknote so if tomorrow you wake up and you find there's no money so what would be the problems? The problems will be one, two, three, four. So if you manage to deal and solve those problems, uh, the position of money in your life is no longer like before uh, the, the incident has happened. So when we look at education, we anticipate that uh, both COVID, when people are coming back, uh, things are going to be drastically different. Um, commuting to schools, you know, um, especially here in, uh, in 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 some of the crowded cities, uh, it, it takes a lot of time. So uh, you get stuck in traffic jams and stuff like that. And then also uh, communicating, learning about technology, getting back to the uh, to the to, to the classes which you have missed, uh, or, like collaborating, you know, uh, with, uh, with, 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 with other students, with teachers and all. It's a complete new experience, but again, I think it will impact the way education is happening all over the world. Uh, the second pillar is technology. So when we look at technology from the mainframe time, you know, where the mainframes are, are available in universities and research, research institutes for a specific, you know, uh, high-end task, you know, that's need to be done for research or stuff like that. Uh, going through the, the 90s and 20s where there used to be big server room in every institution and then once you get out of the office, you cannot use emails, you cannot collaborate uh, probably. Then after that, we move into the 20s where the SaaS model started, where mobiles are available, where even reply to emails, share mention and collaborate, work and call, and then uh, to be able to work structure and, and 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 the process to be changed. So if you are a salesperson, that's uh, uh, had to spend a lot of time out of the office. So uh, you do not need to go back to the office to do things. So the engagement with uh, with being in the office or work premises uh, has started to loosen up. I, I caught uh, Sir Richard Branson a couple of years back, say uh, 10 years ahead of from now, we will look back and we say, why why did we used to go to offices? Because basically you, you, you go to office normally either to get access to information or to have a meeting with a colleague or, or to share some files or, 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 or like to have some resources. Now, we see most of those processes they they could be done remotely and uh, uh, there are many technology companies that have been adapting remote support remote work uh, and stuff like that but again when we have the pandemic uh, everything has to be accelerated a lot of red tapes you know innovation was like uh, it was like a nice to have thing you know to make things better and all this stuff but again uh, it tends to be that innovation and risk management is uh, a real, uh, it's, 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 it's a real important factor. It's a real important factor because nobody saw that everything is going to sh be shut down and about 4 billion people are going to stay home for a month or even for a day, you know. So here, uh, uh, 
all the programs, if any establishment has a program for innovation, has been accelerated technology, supporting, uh, and then uh, based on that, we also develop artificial intelligence great deal. So whatever could be automated, need to be automated immediately because uh, you need to take the human factor out of the uh, out of the uh, of the game because of uh, such pandemic or or other stuff. Uh, so uh, coming back to the third pillar, which is which is the innovation. As I said, uh, basically innovation is often uh, viewed as an application of a better solution uh, to meet new requirement. Uh, 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 you know, so based on that. Uh, uh, we, we see now the new situation that came because of COVID-19 uh, has uh, accelerated a lot of innovation, you know, a lot of innovation, even in the medical field, a lot of innov innovation, you know, like ventilators, you know, open source uh, support, uh, logistic uh, uh, networks are working in a, in a complete different ways, you know, people are even doing many things in a in a, in a very very in a very way so that's all to deal with uh with the with the crisis and this will come back to the the the, the fourth uh, element which is the competitiveness and the competitiveness you know whether it's in economy whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in in sustainable uh, uh development uh it's, it's a very important factor and right now when we look at john hopkins uh, dashboard for uh for uh, for like the uh, the, 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 the pandemic spread, we can see how the competitiveness has been reflecting based on so many factors that has been uh, accumulating over the last 10, 15, or even 50 years. So it's, it's, a, it's an index for, uh, for, for competitiveness, for, for healthcare, uh, for, uh, for collaboration, for logistic network, uh, for basic needs, uh, everything. So right now, I think uh, uh, a lot of innovative programs have been dragging feet, you know, a lot of strategies towards knowledge economy, digital economy, uh, uh, towards, uh, you know, uh, eliminating brick and, and mortar uh, stuff. But again, this pandemic has kept us in reality check on whether it's going to happen or not. And it's a, it's a life or death uh, situation. I mean, like the, there's no option of not making it happen. It needs to happen. So this is a bit of outlines of uh, of uh, what I think and what I've been doing, uh, and 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 how how is it? Maybe we can get into details about each element later as the conversation go. Uh, Walid, thank you very much. This is very very enlightening. Uh transition and continuation of what Dr. Lindsay said earlier. Let me just ask you a couple of questions before I move to Dr. Watt. Uh, how is the situation in UAE in terms of COVID-19 generally? Uh, UAE, see, uh, uh, next week, uh, Dubai is going back uh, uh, with uh, like 50% of the uh, of the local uh, uh, department and 30% with the federal department. Uh, the, the recovery cases has been going in a, in, a, in a very good uh, uh, manner and uh, things are uh, under control uh, it is one of the least places i would worry uh, about and i think it has uh, it has a lot of uh, uh, programs that has been working which has brought up this good output right now okay uh well thank you very very much and uh stay with us and i will come back to you let me uh Introduce now Dr. Uh, Rawat from the University of East London in London. Rawat, assalamu. I, I hope you can see me and yeah. hear me okay. Yeah, now, I can see and hear you now. Good. Thank you very much, and I appreciate you. Uh, your time. And it is great to have you here. Rawat, you are one of few people. Uh, I mean, as I said earlier, all these people, CVs and bio are available. But Rawat is, uh, is uh, his master and his PhD are all about e-learning and uh, artificial intelligence data science so i think Rawad, you are one of the of the young uh, expert in this area which is a growing area many people have talked even the un is now talking about e-learning and uh, he has contributed 
in this area to a large extent in different conferences, uh, articles. So with your experience, uh, Rawat, and uh, I will give you the chance to also show or give us your perspective on the knowledge economy, but I would, I would be very keen if you can also, this terminology or this term artificial intelligence is being used widely now. Everyone talking about artificial intelligence and leadership and so on. And many people claim, some scholars claim that the 21st century or this next uh, era of globalization will be led by artificial intelligence and data science. And you, you know both of them and you're an expert on both of them. But uh, in addition to give us an idea of what these tools or at least artificial intelligence or uh, what is it all about, to what extent you see we have been derailed from the roadmap, we have been, the whole world it has been going down this direction. University are start teaching artificial intelligence, data science courses, everyone is talking about it, policy making, everything. And now suddenly we have this COVID-19. So I'll give you the floor and thank you again. Thank you very much for your time, Rod. It's your, go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Adam. And glad to join you here. Um, I would like to continue with the same setting where we, my previous colleague talked about a little bit about the knowledge economy and then we started to move toward the uh, how technology can help in solving these problems. Now, uh, technology definitely can help in solving um, the problem that we face in knowledge economy, especially with this time of COVID-19. Um, basically, the simple answer we could say, uh, technology can help us making sense of the knowledge economy. Now, mainly we are talking about AI technology in addition to other technologies. But artificial intelligence specifically can help in that because it allows us to capitalize on the knowledge that we have as a human and then also adding a bit of advancement in terms of technology that will allow us to get some kind of internal insights into the data that we have at the moment. Um, one of the main issues here, um, we don't have a very uh, common language, I would say, when we talk about AI. This is something I would say um, a, a problematic issue there, or one of my concerns, because um, we, as, uh, as, as, as uh, let's say, expert in the UK, let's say, we talked about AI or artificial intelligence in different way that other people in, let's say, Africa or Europe or the United States is talking about. Uh, everyone also from, let's say, their career point of view, they are talking about artificial intelligence, let's say, policymakers are talking about something different from technology. Uh, expert and from end user point of view and these are one of the concerns that we are dealing with here especially when we are in this kind of pandemic time um, we want in general AI to help us in solving our life problems usually artificial intelligence can help us in many ways uh, specifically because it can be defined as a machine that can work in the same way that a human works right now um, of course, in the in the way that human are better than machine. Now, this has changed over the last 20 years, let's say, or the last three decades. And we are still seeing many, many changes while we are going to a data-driven uh, AI techniques. One of the things that we we are considering at the moment is, is how AI or artificial intelligence can help us in specifically in knowledge economy. And if we go back to the definition or the four pillar you mentioned, Dr. Adam, where education is one of the key pillars here, uh, we can see how artificial intelligence and technology can help in improving the sustainability of our education and improving the way that we deal with education in the proper way, the way we share information and the way we learn together. And these are all new things that are continuously evolving day after day and we, we can see in 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 uk if i would like to say about this just only some of the uk figure uh, why this is different from other countries because again knowledge economy if you would like to consider it in in the uk is different from and of course in any other country is different from uh, the whole world view point of view so you need to build on whatever you have in terms of information and data and then based on these figures based on these facts you figure out what kind of investment you would like to do and how ai can help you in doing that so if i'm talking about for example some some numbers some figure from from uh, the uk uh, economy um, maybe we can talk about uh, that this is a report published by telegraph 
um, sometimes this year is talking about 134 billion pound investment in intangible assets like data like systems and so on and this is just published by the office of the national statistics and if you go down further the line and just see all these kind of statistics you can see how much we already invested in knowledge and how much of this investment is coming from young businesses and this is when we talk about young businesses this is a very very good point that we would like to um, to reflect on because usually the new companies the new organization usually they invest in technology more than the previous or more than the old one with the hope that this technology will help them to reduce the um, expenditure to reduce the amount of uh, employees we need to restrict the resources and optimize the use of resources and this is one of the very good points that we can start with um, again other another issue here is just we need to invest in our educational system and technology infrastructure AI cannot specifically help in 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 investing in, in infrastructure it, it needs extra cost at, at, at the same point but on the long run it will save a lot of resources and a lot of use from uh, the technology um, again if we can improve our educational system this will improve a lot of of, uh, of our interaction with this pandemic I can refer to one of the examples from this pandemic and this is uh, unfortunately it's, it's a bad story um, at the time of COVID uh, if you go back to the previous time of, of similar situation you would see much more uh, mature I would call uh, behavior in dealing with this pandemic at this time maybe because every country is hit by by this uh, pandemic we can't see a global research effort to solve this problem there are some initiatives and there are definitely some collaboration but there are no they say there is no clear direction where WHO and other organization can lead us to one certain solution maybe because this COVID is hitting us very quickly and very strongly uh, but the way we behave in the UK is different from Germany, different from France, different from the state and different from other countries. And there is no central point where we can share these kind of um, figures, knowledge. I'm talking about now going a step beyond the statistics and we see exactly what's happening, what kind of conclusion we come up with based on data, not just only based on um, investigation coming from doctors and from hospitals. Because doctors and hospitals now, they can do their job they are overstretched and they are doing really good job but again they can they also require help from technology and if, if you just measure it as one of the very advanced MRI um, devices in any hospital you can see how much data you can get from that MRI device and you compare it with whatever we get from a human expert the human expert can play an, a very important role yes but once we match both let's say human expert with the AI over the technology we can if we manage to find the good match between both of them we can definitely get a very good number I pretty much uh, give this or justify this because we don't have a long-term AI strategy dealing with this kind of pandemic um, it will be good if we can learn from this COVID-19 and unfortunately it's, it's, it's not as we expected before it's not going very quickly it will last with us for a while hopefully not too much but it will continue for a while with us despite the situation that we are trying now to go for gradual opening uh, there is no guarantee this will be over very soon so um, I'm, I'm hopefully relying on the technology and the advancement of the technology to learn from this experience and try to put too much data in in the place in order to learn from that and um, yeah we can respond we, we can talk more about this but um, I think we, we just need to leave the floor now for more question I guess if, if there is uh, for that thank you Rawat probably I will get uh, you to deal with this question before I go there but thank you very much very good introduction this is a question just yeah. came how the artificial intelligence could help with COVID-19 I know you start to highlight that but is there any clear answer to that one or uh, because people they can hear about this thing and they say to us uh, I, uh, many times have been accused of being too much academic, but let's yeah. not to be academic now. How can uh, AI help uh, in this COVID-19 era? Is it, what can it do? Yeah, I, I think it, I think it can help in many ways. Uh, one of the ways is just when we get these numbers and try to go one step beyond the numbers, 
and try to predict uh, the behavior of such a, a virus. Uh, this is one of the very good uh, way that we can do. Now, at the moment, we are looking at very descriptive chat, uh, let's say very descriptive dashboards uh, in many of the cases that we have, uh, simply because because of many reasons. One of the reasons that we don't have a clarity about the behavior of such viruses. And again, we don't have enough data to gain some result from, from, from them. And uh, in my view, in few weeks time, maybe less than that, uh, we will get more mature data now because we have data in different places. We have data over time, over summer time, or before summer time, let's say from December time. And now also we, we are learning. And if we manage to capitalize on our learning and put it in one central point, where we can customize this and see the behavior of the virus in different countries, then we, I think we can, AI can predict some of the behavior for this virus and what we can do. Again, AI, for example, can help us in predicting how to recover our economy based on certain factors. And if economy is, is growing, then this is also solving one part of the problem. AI can help us building more advanced educational system. Now we are all learning from home. We are all working from home. So if there is enough technology to support us, then this is also solving or covering part of the story, which is the education. Now, if we manage to connect the dot later on, we'll come up with a better story, at least building up step by step using AI and advanced technology, I guess this would be but and now in 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 total if you look at education in two years time you will find all educational institutes are dealing with ai and technology in a better way before the pandemic why because they realize that this is a plan b that should be ready all the time if we have any cases uh, like you know covid 19 and um, i guess one of the universities here the open university in the uk because they have delivered their own uh, program using online and uh, just virtually. Now they are in advance in most, um, if you compare them to many of our universities here in the UK. Why? Because they have been dealing with these issues for a while and they've learned a lot from them. So they are more, probably more capable of, of going a good progress uh, rather than others. Okay, uh, Rawat, thank you very, very much. And uh, sorry to start hitting you with a question before. Now, let me, uh, you stay with us, Rawat. Let me ask Lindil, because Lindil, you have advised governments uh, in the Caribbean and in San Lucia in particular. It's a country, uh, I keep saying it's a small island. It's not a, it's a huge country yeah. like Nigeria or like Brazil or like, but at the same time, in all well-lit bank reports, they are doing quite well in terms of Comparatively, in terms of knowledge economy, for example, index, they are, they are much better than a, a bigger GDP or a bigger population countries. So perhaps you can, is giving us some ideas about a roadmap for policy formulation. I know you cannot answer a policy formulation question in such a short time, but can you give a, just a very brief roadmap for countries or policymakers who are listening to you now? Not necessarily in the Caribbean or in the Latin Americans or in in poor developing countries. No, uh, across the world, they are listening. They want to to hear from you. What is the roadmap? Give us some tips, some headlines, heads up. What do they have to consider when they're thinking of policy formulation and strategy towards uh, technology? And perhaps examples of maybe from San Luis and other Caribbean countries. Why do you think they are? doing well in terms of uh, knowledge economy? Thank you for that question. I believe that if you look at the case of St. Lucia, our leaders progressively have perhaps been aiming in the right direction, generally speaking. If you look at some of our statistics, for example, our mobile internet penetration rate, on the books, we have more mobile phone connections than people. So we are very well connected. We have lots of young people who are So you have more you have more uh, mobile connection number than the number of people. That's correct. Okay. So one person may have more than one mobile phone. But even then, there's been a noticeable impact with what Rawad mentioned earlier about e-learning, with the first adoption of that new method of delivering learning online. We've noticed the need for the good connectivity 
consistent connectivity and access to not just the device, but the connectivity as well. I believe one of the things we have to look at is any disparities that might cause someone to be disadvantaged because they live in a community, in a household where they may not be enjoying the quality of um, broadband internet that may exist somewhere else. If you look globally, I was very pleased to note that with more and more people working from home, as Rod mentioned earlier, we had the likes of the BBC, we had the likes of Zoom, we had the content providers reducing the level of the quality of the video that they were processing through the networks, just so the availability of, of that and bandwidth to be shared for those who will be working from home, for e-learning, et cetera. I think the collaborative approach that's needed for us globally, even without having access to the AI tools, that sort of global thinking is necessary. Within the Caribbean experience, there is a group called the Caribbean Data Family. We've been looking at and pulling together to review how our statistics compare within our region. The John Hopkins figures which are provided, provide a decent set of statistics, but they're quite high level. And when you look at the Caribbean, we are multiple countries sharing that one space. And we want that granularity to allow us internally to make sense of the data and of our figures. Okay, thank you very much, Lindil. Uh, we have a question here, but I will ask Walid, because you, uh, I know you have global experience, but see, given that you are in Dubai now, you are in the Middle East, Rawad, you can come on to this question if you like after uh, Walid. Read this question, Walid. It says, do you think the artificial intelligence or artificial intelligence could play a role to reduce the negative impact of disability on the Arab world. And by the way, tomorrow we have a round table like this on uh, disability in the Middle East. So Walid, what can you say about this? Uh, Rawada will give you a chance to also comment on this. But Walid, given with your, you are in the region, you are in the Middle East or in the Arab countries, plus your experience, uh, perhaps you can talk us also, maybe you can shed light about mobility and other stuff. You know shown quite, or you have demonstrated quite good knowledge uh, and experience with your company there. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Alam. Yeah, I think uh, the uh, artificial intelligence is bringing a lot of, uh, it's bringing a lot of value uh, towards automating, towards, you know, doing things in a, in a better or different ways, as well as um, uh, enabling, like, for example, in case of the mobility and self-driving cars, or perhaps uh, uh, fighting accidents. So uh, disability also, uh, accidents contribute to 1.3 billion of fatalities uh, between five and 25 years old. So it is, uh, uh, it is the largest uh, uh, killing factor for, uh, for youngers. And uh, disability also comes out of, uh, of accidents. You know, there is a huge range a huge percentage of uh, disability uh, coming out of accidents, especially in the Arab world. So I think uh, utilizing artificial intelligence to fighting uh, traffic accidents and mobility could be a very, uh, a very important uh, role into fighting the cause of disability itself. Again, uh, in 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 in, uh, in Arab countries and especially in UAE, they are special. They are specific. Uh, programs for special needs, you know, programs to accommodate them within the, within, within the workforce, program to enhance them and train them, and as well as programs uh, uh, to enable them to do things that uh, perhaps uh, better than uh, uh, other mobile people. So here we see the artificial intelligence in terms of automation, in terms of uh, changing the way we work in terms of gathering this large amount of unstructured data and then uh, allowing it to, uh, to, 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 to fight disabilities, it's very important. I remember um, a colleague of mine who five years in, uh, it started a company called Kintrans. So the objective of Kintrans was converting sign languages to audible format. 
you know so like for example if you have got a a, 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 a hearing embodied person that's coming to an airport or to, to, or to a, a government service center and this person uh, it's either you bring for him a sign language translator who would understand what this person wants to say or deploy this camera which uses uh, computer vision into identifying the sign languages that uh, the, the sign uh, the, that's uh, uh, presented by this person and then uh, getting an audible format and vice versa even the other guy could type could type the answer and then based on that answer another avatar with the sign language will present the feedback so this is a very uh, this is a very practical uh, example of using of artificial intelligence uh, to, to enhance uh, or to eliminate the negative impact of disability well if i don't interrupt you but just a quick question i remember years ago we have watched here in the uk on tv in uh, one of the uae channels this taxi, which is uh, the, is, is, uh, is, uh, the got no driver, which takes you to your address and so on. Is this on the ground working? Will it is still there? Yeah, they are indeed in the ground. And actually, we participated last year. We participated in uh, in Dubai World uh, 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 conference for smart driving. Uh, okay. It was a conference that uh, was last uh, in October last year. So we participated in this conference, and then they were demonstrated a lot of self-driving cars on real, you know. And, and, uh, and do you see a potential for these self-driving cars in the future? Of course. I mean, like, uh, uh, Dubai has a, uh, a strategy for the government by 2030 that 25% of the rights should be done autonomous. So based, based on that, the road and transport authority uh, had... Uh, Yes, uh, last year had uh, a challenge of self-driving uh, okay. mobility, and uh, this challenge was participated by big players, right, from the biggest players globally up to education institution as well as the startup. And uh, the the output of this uh, of this uh, challenge it was in the conference which I mentioned earlier back in uh, in October. Okay, also, that's fine. Thank you yeah. very much, uh, Walid. Let me. Let me just ask uh, Rawad. Rawad, if you want to add more, you can add. But my question to you, Rawad, is really, you are an experienced person with e-learning. This is your, the core of your research, your PhD, and you are leading this in different, at King's College, now in UEL, University of East London. And the UN is very interested, and I remember you joined this. Now, to what extent do you see e-learning is, is the way forward, which we all agree, but Again, the poor and rich for, uh, conflict is again prevailing again, where those who are rich countries, OCDs countries, those who they have good infrastructure, are benefiting and enjoying the, the massive, if you like, breakthrough advantage, uh, keeping their life going during the lockdown in the in like in the UK, Spain, Europe, whatever it is. But those in the developing countries, the poor countries with poor ICT infrastructure. Because e-learning, you need an internet, basic, for example. The, the starting point is internet. To what extent you think the poor are still to suffer? Because this COVID-19 had shown us in the US, those who are poor likely to be hit harder. Because if they are poor, they are likely to have obesity problem. They are likely to, to eat junk food. They are likely to have uh, diabetics, uh, heart problems. Okay. And so on the way their flats, congested housing. So poverty is still uh, that conundrum between poverty and riches. There, to what extent do you see this advancement, like the one Walid was just talking about? We are so advanced, like in Dubai and others. Uh, we in the in the in the developing countries, the poor countries, are really the losers here. Or do you see them not losers, but actually benefiting from the advancement of what people have done? So where do you stand on this? And do you see what the opportunities do you think e-learning will bring to developing poor countries? Yeah, I think uh, we have to agree in the beginning, uh, there is no 100% fair technology that will solve the problem for everyone. But um, I think technology with AI advancement especially will help to reduce that gap between uh, rich and poor 
for many reasons. One of these reasons is these technology can be invented by, let's say, any companies or inventors anywhere in the world, and they can be used, let's say, with limited capabilities. So if you don't have the full capabilities to, let's say, buy a very strong uh, software, at least you can benefit from its basic functionalities. And that could be with free cost or with uh, limited cost. Again, the innovation of the open source software systems, this is also another good improvement that we can, in the poor country, say, yeah, we can use these kind of technologies because of the uh, free or, let's say, no cost associated with, uh, with running these software systems. Now, again, advancement will continue. And then we, if we are talking about poor country, poor country will not be able to move, for example, toward uh, driverless cars, okay, for many reasons. Uh, but they can at least do some kind of move toward, let's say, e-learning environment. And just to respond, to come back to the question that have been asked before, how AI can help, uh, I would say, especially in disability, uh, we all know that disabled people are having less chances than other people, normal people, to learn and to participate in public life. So now when you try to invent a technology to um, do some kind of captioning for YouTube videos and other video environment, then this is a good technology to allow people who can't hear, for example, have some kind of hearing disability to watch and get the benefit of learning something. And what we call now in university, we started to develop, well, not started, but for a long time now, not, not so long, we are starting to talk about inclusive strategies for learning and teaching. So inclusive, I mean, we offer learning for many people, regardless if they are disabled or not. In this way, if I have 20 or let's say 10% of the community have some kind of disability, I don't want to lose their contribution to the community because their contribution to the community will enlarge our opportunities to learn more, will also increase our economy, will develop our economy and our knowledge. So this is this is the way that we, we see AI. And if you look at the famous uh, physicist uh, Stephen Hawking, and you see this is, imagine if we don't have that technology that will enable some persons like him to be active scientists, imagine how much knowledge we will lose. Now, not every person like him, definitely, but there are other people who are not enabled because of their physical or mental disability to do um, or to contribute to the society. So I think um, the, the coming back to your question is the, the gap will probably will stay, but not will not be as large as it, as it should be right now. Uh, I think with the more we move toward uh, our new normal, if I would say, after COVID-19, where we would like to coexist with such pandemic, uh, we will see some initiatives like open source software system. We'll see some initiatives like supporting educational, um, like other big companies um, and Microsoft and other, they are trying to make this software um, free for a while. So we'll see some initiative here and there. Uh, poor countries will still to suffer to some extent to adjust from one model to another. But again, uh, this might also come to different kind of benefit. So uh, London air now is equality is, is much, much cleaner before the pandemic. Why? Because people stopped traveling. Now this is not a solution, but Facebook, for example, I remember they said 50% of our employees will continue working from home if they want after the end of this pandemic. So this means that we reduce the use of private transport, we reduce the use of public facilities and so on. So uh, these changes will come up later on uh, all the time. So uh, we will have to consider all of these factors and look at this from a comprehensive point of view in order to see what kind uh, of inv innovation we can do in order to solve these problems together. Okay, Rawad, thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, let you. me... I am also wide of the time, and I'm, please accept my apology for taking more than I promised to take from your time, but thank you. Now, Linda, there is a big argument worldwide. I have seen this even within the UN debates. When we go to even to the UN, they talk about this one. There is, there is one argument, and this is going on for 10 years now. Right. The UN, one of the UN reports back in 2008 or 9, I can't remember, about ICT for development, it argues that uh, most technology produced in developed countries, in the U.S., Silicon Valley, OECDs countries, is, is uh, most of the time is being produced with ignorance, even though the United Nations report itself used that word, with ignorance or of developing countries' needs. 
So in the simplest way, to put it simply to our audience, uh, in the Silicon Valley, they develop a new technology or a new way of doing things, whatever it is. They don't really have the developing countries in mind, but they do have the developed countries in mind. And that's when it comes to business, when we teach students, it's true, and it does match with the global world trade. So in the past, still I think, 50% of the whole world trade, 50% of the whole world trade is actually happening within just 10 or 12 countries within OCD. Japan, UK, Germany, believe it or not. So right. if you take Africa, Asia, in terms of global trade, it's really happening 50% in big, big companies, like countries. So to what extent you leading a company yourself, to what extent you agree or disagree or have that view changed now? Now we are in 2020. I'm, I'm, I'm calling, I'm giving you seven, eight, ten years reports from the UN arguing companies, or I'm not saying companies like yours, but technology providers and ICT companies to really seriously consider developing countries' capabilities and needs rather than just thinking of those of us in UK and so on. That's number one. Number two, uh, sorry to give you a big question, but that because I want Walid to come in after you on this. Uh, for both of you and Walid, both of you are in the industry or leading in companies. To what extent, Lindel, you see, or your evaluation as uh, someone with this experience, do you see globally? I know this is, again, you cannot answer it now immediately without looking at the data. To what extent you can say we have been worldwide technologically reasonably prepared to use either existing technology like Zoom, like this system. We have never used this B Live before. Now we are using it every day. It's perfect. You can see we are not talking to you. We are people in South Africa that are watching you in Sudan, in everywhere now. So these technologies, they were there before, Zoom and all this stuff. But now we have been using it. We could have used them before, before the crisis. We had used them, but not like now. So to what extent you think countries have already been well prepared or reasonably prepared to really adopt and use technology to run their life, not necessarily during the lockdown, but we could have been using this long time ago to get great minds like you from all over the world and let them talk. So it's two bars, but uh, apology about it. it's a long question, but because I wanted to spill over to Walid so he can take over from you. Okay, the first point you made, the first part of your question about the development of technology with our uh, based on some sort of a dependency which would exist in a developed uh, environment, in a developed nation. I think that is true. And it just reflects where the innovation takes place. And I think that's why in our particular circumstances where we have resource constraints, we cannot afford to spend the money that we would need to get the most up-to-date software, the most up-to-date licenses, the cutting edge technology. We have to make do with what we have. And that includes cutting our cutting our budgets accordingly. So using open source software like Rawat mentioned, I think is a natural way to look at how do we work within the constraints that we have. And I think it's a, it's a sensible place to begin. If you look at the development of mobile money in Africa, M-Pesa, that was where it started because they did not have the landline support that existed say in the likes of the UK, they had to use their mobile technology. So the thousands of miles of copper that would have been there to connect the vast distances was not there. They had to use mobile technology. So I think even if we look at what we have and our own constraints and our small size may be one of those constraints. If we start looking at what do we need for our context, that will drive a certain level of creativity and innovation. And ultimately, I think intellectual property, which would then start to ease that balance somewhat. If we forever import a solution that was developed for another place with maybe a higher standard of living, with maybe more money to spend, with better quality internet, etc., we would always be playing catch up. So I think that's one way we could, although it requires some pain to have to go into that space, to have to innovate your way out. It's something I believe COVID-19 is forcing upon all of us everywhere at the same time. Because no matter what your size is, there's a constraint. We saw that with the hospitals. If you're a large country, you have a large population, there'll be a large number of people arriving in the hospital. In a smaller country, 
relatively fewer people. But again, you run into that constraint. Regarding your next point, Alam, about why did not why we didn't adopt some of those technologies and ways of working before now, I think there's an urgency of now. Maybe there was also a crisis of imagination. Maybe we were just comfortable doing what we were accustomed to doing, which is the very antithesis of innovation. But now, when you're forced to continue to work and you have to work from home, because the office is not large enough for the physical distancing required, you have to be creative. So what I like about what you said, Rawat, about people working from home and the workplace no longer being in the center of the city. The, where you work just happens to be where you have your laptop, your computer, your mobile device, and your connectivity. I think that has a role to play in diffusing the adoption of technology throughout the country, not just concentrating it in cities. I believe that's a good thing. But going back to the urgency of now, if you cannot bring all your employees into your workspace, you have to find a way for them to deliver work from wherever they are. So I believe that was part of what kept us back, generally speaking, that things were working well enough, there may have been less pressure to leapfrog the problem that we faced, we are faced with now. Okay. Uh, that's a very, uh, very good answer, uh, uh, Dr. Lindil. And I think I would like uh, uh, Walid, Engineer Walid, to continue, uh, particularly from UAE perspective. And I think UAE also is one of the countries been highlighted by the World Bank report a couple of times, 1998 and in 2010. And I think in 2010, uh, the United Nations. Uh, is by rations that 50 percent uh, that countries across the whole world should achieve something they call it uh i can't remember the exact uh, naming but they they wanted the whole world countries you know the un they will just recommend they can't enforce countries to do things but the united nation wanted by 2010 which is 10 years old now uh, all countries across the world to have a minimum of 50 percent household connectivity with broadband so if you have 10 million households, they want you to have 5 million, they, they have broadband. And interestingly, only five countries in the world will achieve that. Only five countries in the world. One of them was UAE. So UAE has been reported many times in World Bank report with the knowledge economy in terms of doing very well, one of the top five countries which achieved that. And secondly, uh, Walid, if you can comment on that. I have been in conversation with uh, someone running a major project for the government in uh, UAE. And he told me, you can really Alam, see what you have been talking about, about the resilience of the system, deploying knowledge to make organizations very strong, to make it efficient. He said to me, you can really, I wish you were here, you could have seen the resilience of the systems in governments uh, and I said, what do you mean by that? He said to me, governments in UAE, in governments, he was talking about the government system, is working as efficient as with before the lockdown. So during the lockdown, the government system was working very efficient. So uh, to what extent, Walid, uh, I know there's many reasons behind the country investment. Is it to do with investment? Or is it to do with uh, leadership, like uh, Lendi said, because he said in Thalosia, he said, from the prime minister or the government, they were very keen uh, to lead that way and take example, like in Sudan, there is no even inform government information officers. We have been discussing this a few days ago. So why in Thalosia you have a, the, 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 the prime minister or the president, whatever, is leading the way in driving the movement towards information and communication and knowledge in countries you don't even have that person. So what is happening and what lessons can be learned from UAE taking into account also the neighboring Bahrain is being cited by the United Nations uh, World Bank, sorry, World Bank report as one as number one in ICT. I can't remember 2015 or 18, number one in terms of ICT. And that's why you can see it in Bahrain very well. So what is your comment on this and what are the lessons learned? I think I think the uh, leadership play a very very important role because it cultivates and uh, and, and and put the, the strategies forward. 
I, I caught uh, Sheikh Mohammed about 20 years ago uh, uh, when, when the inauguration of uh, Dubai Internet City, which was one of the main technical hub in the region here, which, has, uh, which is hosting now most of the multinational uh, technology companies from all over the world. He said, if it's good for business, it's good for Dubai. So uh, the, 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 whole, the, uh, the, the whole direction is to get into the latest technology, uh, to get into uh, the latest stuff. Uh, this year uh, was called the year to prepare for the 50 years ahead. Yani before even, uh, before even uh, 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 getting the pandemic really spread out and everything, this year was planned to prepare for 20, 2070, which is the next vision. Uh, the the space uh, the space uh, program uh, is is launching uh, a vehicle to Mars. So uh, they've already taken uh, the, uh, the 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 whole setup and it's going to be launched uh, uh, or it's, it's been launched already. So uh, uh, we we believe that based on what the leadership is. Uh, is, is trying to to convey to the citizen is that uh, nothing is impossible you know the second part is the investment in human capital uh, i was in the e-government early in uh, in the 20s and we used to have uh, like waves of students that we do the, the 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 project with them you know like internship like the the final year project like four months and stuff like that and I'm very glad to see some of those students are right now leading big organizations. They're leading government departments. Uh, uh, they have been uh, very well taken care of, and they also have the enthusiasm and the resilientness in order to make it ahead. So basically, what we see is like nothing is impossible. Uh, the second thing is like the innovation. Right after the economic crisis in 2008, uh, 2008 you know, uh, there was a huge move towards innovation and uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship ecosystems. There are a lot of uh, big projects that came out uh, during this time. For example, souk.com, which was acquired by Amazon. Uh, it was one of the main innovative companies that came up after the economic crisis, and Souk is uh, is employing about uh, I think thousands of people that have been employed by Souk, and now it's been sold to Amazon. Another another startup that came out of this ecosystem is uh, uh, is Karim, Karim, which was sold to Uber for three point one billion uh, dollar. So uh, uh, the, 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 these success stories they have been. Uh, a product of a continuous uh, successful strategy, uh, a cultivation of uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem, as well as a lot of support uh, to the whole uh, to, uh, to to the to the whole uh, you know business community. So I come also to you about uh, about why technology companies do not care about other uh, uh, other location, maybe less fortunate locations. You know, when, when, when you look at establishing, especially a, techn a technology business, uh, you, look at, you look at something called business model converts. You, you, you're not, you, do, you do not have the capacity and the resources to put a complete business plan. So if we look at the school of Steve Planks, he's an entrepreneurship uh, a professor in, in Stanford University, uh, he identified the startup as an entity that is looking for a repeatable and sustainable business model. So when you are looking for a repeatable business, a scalable business, a sustainable business, the conversation is two-way conversation. Mean that the whole technology startup is about, uh, it's about hypothesis. So I assume if I do like one, two, three, four, then this will sort out the problem for version A, version B, and version C. So what's happened now, whenever any startup, especially in technology product, they come up with the first set of hypotheses, 
and then they go back they go to their customers and then they get the feedback and then based on this uh, progress back and forth then the product is being developed uh, based on the uh, client need based on the customer need because end of the day if i'm selling product online i'm selling a technology product then it's completely based on the customer satisfaction and the value that you are transferring so when we look at this when we look at startup at silicon valley they wouldn't have access to for example uh to 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 clients or customers in africa or in asia and all this nevertheless there are some countries like kenya particularly and i've been involved in young african leadership initiative which was uh, uh which was uh, uh uh, was established by President Obama uh, uh, about 10 or 12 years uh, uh, back. And then the objective of the uh, of the program was to develop the national development and to develop the public sector and the governance, public sector, uh, education, and entrepreneurship. So in that program, uh, as mentors, we used to mentor small groups of entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs that can bring up some uh, of this new stuff. As Lenin said, MBISA is a very successful model that's been presented to the to the world. And another and another very successful product is Yushahidi. You know, Yushahidi it's a it's a it's a Ferris response system that has emerged during the riots in Kenya, the election riots. So yep. through you, Shahidi, it's an open source platform, and then it, it has been used in the hurricane in Haiti, it has been used in the pandemic right now, in Italy, Spain, and different places, as, uh, as one of the most uh, trusted uh, various response system, which identified the demand and supply in crisis uh, situation. So I believe that it's a responsibility of the, the leadership of every country to establish that innovation platform and ecosystem uh, in order to allow this innovation to come from within the, the, the people of the country. And I will quote here uh, an, 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 an experience that uh, we had with, with Belarus, for example. I have been using back office development for, from Belarus for the last 10 years uh about i think last october we were in, in 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 belarus and they took us the government took us for like a tour to the tech hub and they have a very inspiring story you know uh, belarus was a hub of uh, of technology development during the past post uh, the, during the the soviet union and then uh, uh it has the, the the educational capability to bring engineers who are participating in spaceship programs, nuclear program, uh, chip development, and all this stuff. When, 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 when the situation in the Soviet Union, they found out there is a, a lot of human capital that coming out from Belarus that's going to Europe, they're going to Japan, they're going to US, and based on that, they figured out they have about fifty thousand tech experts that are being graduated every year. And they established the tech hub. They did a lot of government subsidization. When they did, they created the ecosystem. Today, Belarus has R&D hubs for a lot of uh, big companies. You know, uh, you, you see these companies where you come in, uh, at one premises and you see 1,000 people. They're all paid in, in, in foreign currency. They are all living in their uh, country. And it has contributed, I think, closer or or, or uh, closer to fifty percent of the of the GDP of the country. So this is one 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 of one of the establishment. When you look at Estonia, for example, you look at Estonia; they've created the e-residency program. Uh, their model is to bring the techno, techno, technical entrepreneurs from outside the country, and then uh, give them the platform. Uh, right now, the e-residency program. Uh, to, to, uh, uh, Estonia has one of the most mature e-government program. Like literally, you could do everything without visiting anywhere. You do have a card with uh, with the PKIs, and then you can do everything there. So they have focused into getting 
more companies established in Estonia uh, facilitate the whole uh, 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 the whole requirement in the ecosystem, and then uh, uh, capitalizing on Estonia being uh, being the the, the, the birthplace of Skype. It's been the best place of transferware. It's been the best place of uh, of many other uh, innovative companies. Bolt, Bolt is established in Estonia. Uh, uh, you know, Taxify, uh, ta Taxify right now established in Estonia. So these companies are, uh, are 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 a product of that particular uh, enhancement, the, the the ecosystem which has been. Uh, really open with very very minimum red red tapes. I mean, I could see absolutely no red tapes. And no, no, this fine. is the responsibility. No, no. So, sorry to interrupt you, Walid. Well, I thank you very very much. I know we exceeded all our time, and uh, uh, just to bring, I, I I I wish just to maybe to mention one because we have a large network across the whole world. Dream. Uh, she's a consultant for the World Lead Bank, many organizations for the Gulf, or she's a well-known person in knowledge economy. I tried to invite her to intervene, but I think we will definitely get her on board one time. But what I wanted to say, using this Reem as an example, she's in Jordan, uh, not necessarily the people are in our network. If you would like to propose anyone, we, we have always committed to bring the best expert we can bring. We're always keen on to bring people from all across the world. Yes, we are a UK founded and based organizations, also American. I mean, the founding organizations are U UK here in the U and in the United Kingdom and also in the US, but we're really trying to reach everywhere. We have people from South Africa, Latin America and Brazil, in all of African countries, Middle East, almost every place. So please, if you want to, particularly we are very keen to discuss the topic which people they want to listen about it. So that's number two. Number three, all these topics that will be go and in our, uh, we have a big library and I know universities are using it. We have one article published by a Nigerian professor. I have seen it long time ago when people showed me the records. It's been uh, downloaded 48,000. So for people like us, Rawat can agree with me, academic in the UK, if you have one of your articles being downloaded 48,000, that's a big impact. Because we're not just here talking about, uh, I, I'm sure all of you, you, it's not about having a master or a PhD, it's really about having him back. So I would like to, uh, so please go to our website, was.org.uk. Now, I would like to finish, and I will give you this, uh, what? So you have the pleasure of the, finishing this talk on my behalf, on these other two guests' behalf. Now, Rawad, I'm just going to, to, to give you that opportunity because you are an educator, you are a lecturer at the university, and your core of your research, your PhD is about e-learning. Now, during this lockdown, we're going to continue to be locked. Yes, there is some ease and not ease, but we are going, life is not normal and we will continue to be locked down. Even after this easing of logging down, we're still going to be minimizing our time out of the house. We are staying in houses. Can you please give a practical advice as an educator, as an, an e-learning expert? Kids, women, young generation in particular, because we are very keen on young generations, give them advice. Uh, I remember we had on this program, uh, Dr. Uh, what's his name? From Saudi Arabia, who was in Brighton, Dr. Bates. He gave the, in his talk like 20 websites where people can actually go and study for free. Big, big organization. What, do you, what is your recommendation to, to be able to do at home? watch uh, videos uh, of uh, learning, how to entertain themselves. You know, the mental well-being of people is becoming very seriously now being evaluated. Governments want to get us out of the house because they said mentally we're going to be very stressed. So kids, young women in particular as well, young generations, give them some tips. How can they benefit from whatever the level of, of broadband they have, level, whatever the level of ICT if they are in Africa, in America, give them whatever experience. You yourself have a global experience. So I, I will let you finish with advice for people staying at home. I want your advice to encourage more people to stay at home, but to entertain them at home. Okay, thank you so much. A very difficult question. Uh, tend to be a, a, like a government <laughs> response to these issues. But anyway, I mean, uh, 
there is a plenty of things that we can do at home actually uh, and you are right when you said the uh, government would like us to uh, to, to, to or to go outside home because of these kind of mental issues and again this links us to our previous question how AI can help in, in, in this pandemic it can predict the mental issues that people will suffer from this is one of the issues that uh, some AI researchers are looking into now now again um, I guess internet becomes one of the very key aspects of our life from now on um, things will not go back to normal in the very very close time so we will have a new norm I guess universities will not open their uh, spaces and if they open their spaces that will be for a limited number of users so we'll no longer see students 400 students in one uh, large uh, theater let's say um, we will get used now to what we call dual delivery for all of our activities uh, so once we have the seminar we will make it maybe physically available maybe after a couple of years but we'll continue de delivering the same activity online for those who cannot join us simply because there are vulnerable people who cannot be inside you know these uh, buildings who cannot also commute and travel to uh, to these uh, activities so i would say we need to use um, the internet connections that we have the broadband connections uh, very carefully um, I think many of us as end user, we are not ready to fully work from home, to fully learn from home. We don't have the um, specific equipment that we need. And that's why we use to travel to the university to work from there. We use to travel to companies to travel to work from there uh, instead. Uh, now, um, there are some companies now they're changing their business. I think IKEA, they started to sell what we call work from home office so this is, has been never there <laughs> now this is a new invention in their business model because they need to adapt and adjust to this new era now i would say um not all of us we are lucky here in the uk and particularly in the uae and the united arab emirates and some other countries as well with this broadband connection resources i think um in other countries we don't have that luxury of internet connections but we can at least use some of the resources, list resources intensive uh, lectures. We have a lot of Coursera and also these kind of massive open online courses that we can use. Uh, we can also connect with our uh, peers, with our colleagues who work in different places, different companies to share experiences with them. I mean, we could simply do simple thing, um, just reviewing a book, a session that we agree there is a book uh, that we need to read in the next week or next couple of weeks and we come up with a session online to do a review for that book what we learn from that book what we can learn if we continuously read in the same way and this is something uh, yeah it needs some connection needs some connectivity but again it's it's one of the way that we need to change our culture to deal with this pandemic kids need to be you know educated how to learn um, how to deal with environment like this um, we have been you know giving them access to online now, internet resources, I would say in, not in a very good way because um, if we leave them in front of these, these computers for a long time, uh, their mental activity might be affected as well. And we cannot also, uh, let's say, monitor them all the time. So this thing we need also to consider. So we need again to go back, analyze whatever resources we have, whatever problem we were trying to tackle and look at this one by one and it's different from one family to another one country to another one person to another but there are also plenty of opportunity online so we we'll try to grab whatever we can for the sake of developing our knowledge um, getting some changes some innovative model for our business some ways to interact with our families and so on so that's probably uh, my quick response hopefully <laughs> it's useful Thank you very much, uh, Rawad. Uh, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, I think we almost spent one and a half hours. That's the maximum, really. I, I am allowed to go so over it. But uh, I, it has been great to have you all. They are, uh, uh, they are really great speakers. And I really appreciate your, your sharpness in your answer. And we have learned a lot. Walid, uh, Walid is, uh, when you go to his uh, LinkedIn profile, he's in the top 
100 top 50 top 10. Uh, all I know about this top in the past when I was a student is the top 10 in the music, you know, in the songs. <laughs> but as this list is growing, top 10 or top 100, Walid, thank you very much. And I wish to see you in the number one, not only in the top 100 or not 50. Walid has shared with a very good experience. Uh, Lindy, really grateful for your wealth of experience because not many people even have traveled to the Caribbean. They don't know even how to go there. Uh, so bringing that on board was very, very good because I have seen the Caribbean. I know how great these nations, how resilient they are. I'm bringing that, showing us how they are using technology is very good. And also your global experience. You studied in one of the best universities in this country, in Glasgow. And Rawat, thank you very, very much. Uh, I think you are one of the luckiest to be having that uh, for, forefront science, like the data science, and artificial intelligence. Thank you. thank you for your time and I appreciate it. But just to clarify for people, uh, many people, they send me, Adam, can you publish the timetable? Unfortunately, it's very difficult because these people, uh, Rawad is in London, uh, Lindy in San Lucia, and uh, Walid is in uh, Dubai. All the people we bring, there are from different parts of the world. So we really have to manage the timing. And sometimes someone is, like la la the other two days, we have one from uh, New Zealand. She said tomorrow um, night. Tomorrow night is like early morning here. So it's not easier to get people uh, because they are not in the same place, number one. Number two, they asked me about the language and I did explain that. We will try our best. We will stick to the English, but sometimes we have the three speakers speaking Arabic and I can speak Arabic, we speak in Arabic like tomorrow. I will tell you about this shortly. We are very keen to get the French because we get within our network, lots of people who speak French. So it's just a bit depending on people availability. And I, 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 I am hoping Professor Abdel Ghadir from Lille University will lead on that very soon because he speaks French, English and Arabic. And he can lead because we got lots of expertise on French from North Africa, from France and other parts. And we will keep, uh, but we you have to appreciate, we need to get the four people. Translation is very difficult on this one. We're doing our best to make it. It's, uh, uh, again, that can open up the gate for uh, just uh, asking people to help this initiative. Because in order to get people to get translator to use more expensive systems, it really needs funding and which we don't really have at the moment. But finally, to finish this conversation, I would like to say the following. Uh, for those who are joining us tomorrow, we have a very uh, important uh, round table about disability uh, in the Arab countries. And we are very, very lucky to have four distinguished speakers. We got uh, first Dr. Haysam al-Bashir. Haysam is an expert, he's a consultant in neuroscience. He's uh, currently based in Dubai as well. Uh, he was a leading consultant here in the UK. He's an expert on child disability. So really, you will hear to top people really tomorrow as well. We have Fawaz al-Dakhil, who is in Saudi Arabia. We wish him all the best. He's uh, one of the leading campaigners for disability in the Arab world. Unfortunately, he's sick on hospital. He's still insisting to join tomorrow. And we have Dr. Muhammad Abdin. He will join us from Japan. And uh, he's someone who started his blind. He continued all the way until he became a distinguished professor in uh, Japan. So you will see a very sound experience. And the fourth and last but not least, we have Najwa Hussain from London. She is... Uh, Someone with tremendous experience in, in the media, she's a journalist, but in addition to that, she herself, she, uh, I can't remember how many years, but like 10, 15, 20 years, I'm not sure, she, for, uh, uh, for a medical reason, she also became uh, using now wheelchair. So she started her life, she was a normal person, but then she became also disabled. So she, we're going to learn a lot from her in both disability in women and uh, as a journalist. Now, having said all that, tomorrow I have reminded people, and I know my colleagues have done the same, but tomorrow the session starts at 1 o'clock London time, 1 p.m. London time. And the reason for that, so it can allow uh, time for Japan, the time different in, the, in Japan is quite far away. So please remember, remind all those who are in, uh, watching us now and they would like to join us tomorrow, tomorrow our debate will start at 1 p.m. London time, not 6.30. And with that, I would like to thank you all again. Thank you very, very much. And I hope to see you tomorrow at 1 o'clock, not 6.30. Thank you, Rawat. Thank you, Lindy. And thank you, Wally. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.
please remember, if we all help and do a little bit, it will make a big difference.